Today we have a topic that I'm sure very few of us have been exposed to. We may have heard and maybe seen virtual reality in the form of electronic games, but not how VR is applied for academic and commercial applications. The Faculty of Engineering, Built Environment and Information Technology at the University of Pretoria plays a significant role in mining, teaching, learning and research and contributes new ways of innovating for the future. Now this led to the establishment of the Kumba Virtual Realis Reality Center for Mine Design, in short VR Center, which was made possible through an 18.8 .8 million rand investment by Kumba Iron Ore. The Kumba Virtual Reality Center for Mine Design simulates high-risk scenarios in a safe and controlled environment where the consequences of any unsafe act can be powerfully demonstrated without causing any actual loss of life and damage to property. Sorry, I'm just going to mute a few more people or those who aren't muted, if you can just mute yourself. Yanni Maris is a senior lecturer in the Mining Engineering Department at the University of Pretoria and is also the head of this Virtual Reality Center. Yanni started his career in production as Mining Engineering graduate for a major gold company where he obtained all his industry certificates in mining as well as rock engineering. Pursuing his passion for research and teaching, he joined the University of Pretoria as Senior Lecturer in Rock Engineering and Mine Design. He is particularly fond of optimization, pillar design and technology transfer. Now, welcome once again Yanni, all the way from Pretoria. I'm very excited to hear your presentation, so over to you. Thank you, Jan, and um, good morning to everyone on the other side. So it's um, thank you very much for the invitation to come and share what we are doing here at UP, and especially in the mining department. So as you can imagine, engineers now venturing into the technology field, it's typically not what we do. And as an engineer, we're typically not very creative. So drawing the, the cartoons and making all the, all the fancy little um, storyboards is quite a challenge for us but I'm going to share our learnings over the past few years and um, the way we see teaching going forward, especially for the engineering discipline. So um, if you don't mind, I'm going to also stop sharing my video. Otherwise, you're going to look like I'm watching tennis because I have my two screens on. And then I'll just uh, do my sharing. I can just get my share going. So on the presentation side, I believe you can see that now. Is it fine, Johan? Can yes, we... yes, Yanni, we can okay. see it. Thank you. Sure. Then let me go straight on to this one. So firstly, there's going to be a lot of abbreviations I'm going to start off with. But um, in the course of the presentation, I'll definitely discuss those, the meanings of all these fancy acronyms. So my presentation mainly will be about the use of XR technology at UP. Focusing on the mining side where we are situated, but also other departments, which also in the recent um, few months also joined and um, get onto this, this technology now to transfer the technologies. So just a little bit of background. Uh, so that in 2015, the Mining Virtual Reality Center was launched. So as Johan mentioned, there was a generous contribution from Kumba Mining that um, enabled us to build this facility. And then the university also added a little bit more. So we upgraded the whole, whole mining department, came to a new floor. So we are grateful for that. So we have a, a very modern um, teaching facility at the mining engineering side as well. Then in 2018, the School of IT, and especially the program for multimedia, they have started with a VR in, and interaction lab where they have, as part of their modules, the first year they have a module called VR technology and the students then get into the technology and try to see what's happening and what this VR thing is all about. So they launched the lab 
on their side, not knowing really what we are doing on our side. And then we were invited to that launch and there we met the, the head of that facility and the relationship started from our side. As I mentioned, engineers, we can teach the, techno we can teach the, the technical side of it, but sometimes uh, we just do engineering drawings on a whiteboard and we transfer that to the students. And they then come to the party and they can help us then convert that onto a digital platform and see how we can make in better experiences for the students in that sense. So now the lab is now sharing all the, the okay. XR technologies right. and trying to get that rolled out into the industry and more to the, to the university itself. So their focus is really to look at cross-departmental cross and faculty collaboration. So from their side, being the school of IT, being multimedia, now starting to talk with, them, with medicine and veterinary sciences, theology, geology, uh, the NAS department, natural sciences. So all those departments and faculties are now starting to get onto this technology bandwagon, if you want to call it that. They also then look at the research, the development and education of it. They are really focused on the hardware side. So they look at what is commercially available, how can that be implemented and with a little bit of development, develop application for that rather than do the physical um, development and research on the hardware and the limitations of those. So they target then of course on the VR interventions now to teach students and getting a better retention rate of the knowledge that's been transferred. So this year after COVID, so everyone complains about COVID and we use COVID as a um, scapegoat for all of our non-deliverables. But in the past two years, we spent a lot of time optimizing the whole process. So I think the last two years was actually good for our department and our, our team looking after, after this technology. So now we're gonna go and take that into the industry and see maybe the next step after training, of course, is the application to see if this technology actually has application value in there. So just before I get into the XR technologies and the the discussions around that. Just some touches touches on the 4IR terminology and the flavor of the month that's currently running out there. So there's four focus areas in the 4IR drive. First one being automation. Second one is all the artificial intelligence and everything that goes around that. Then connectivity and communications. And the fourth one that's part of this, this super group of 4IR technologies is now the, the new energy. Um, scavenging the Google images, I found this fancy um, picture that shows a little bit about the technologies. And I just want to highlight that this just to focus and then see where this actual immersive technology falls into. So the first one, as we said, was automation. So how to get the, get the things to do it on their own. Then the second one is AI, where machines start to learn themselves. But apart from that, somebody still needs to write the algorithms and let the machine learn himself and then show him what is correct and what is wrong. So we need to still have that intelligence built into the artificial one. Then the communications, we look at cloud computing. Everything is in the cloud these days. So if I look quickly outside the window, nothing will be online because there's no clouds in the sky. So what does that mean and how do you fit it in there? And then the fourth one was the new energies. And we know what happened in the past week or so, the, the discussions and the, the notices that came from, from government. So we need to look at new alternative sources and how to get that into it. So opening up all four, the immersive technology sits in that space. So with all those technologies mentioned and the techniques that we can communicate a little bit better, immersive technologies falls within that connectivity and communications sphere. So what is all this fuss about? What do you, why do we need it and what is it all about? So if you look on the picture on the right and on the left hand side, let me just open up my... So on the left hand side, you will see that there's a, a present, representation of the continuum. So we call it the, the RV of the relativity of, reality, virtuality, continuum. Now it's just fancy words for meaning nothing. So on the left hand side, you'll see this, that's a real environment. That's where we sit today in front of a computer talking to each other. 
So that's the real environment. And right on the opposite side, we have this virtual environment. So that is everything that digital, it's somewhere we don't know where it is, but it, 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 does, it does coexist in our space. Now, as we move to the left and right of this continuum from real life to computer life, that is where all this technology lies. So the, more, the closer you come to real life, that's where the augmented reality sits. And as you move more to the computer side, that's where the augmented virtuality or virtual reality actually reside. And then the, 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 the collective noun for all these technologies is the mixed reality. So where I operate in a virtual space, I move buttons or I move joysticks and I press buttons that then with the internet of things communicate to a machine which actually then does what I told him on the computer to do. So that is your mixed reality zone. And then the one bigger than that, the XR is really just the bigger one. So that includes everything. And that's the extended reality. So if we talk about XR, it means what technology or what piece of equipment, what tool can be used from a real life as we have it today, a, a real-time hammer versus the artificial joystick, which we move up and down, and where does that fit? So different environments, different, um, different uses. So some examples, I mean, we've seen a few of these examples going around. So firstly, if you look at the VR space, the virtual reality space, it is typically a headset that you put over your, over your eyes. And the moment you're into that space, you really, um, transported to a different environment. So you can be sitting in Pretoria and I can transport you to teleport you into a surface mine in the Northern Cape. So you'll be in, immersed in that environment. That's typically how it's interacted with. You have these controls in your hand and um, by using the, the, the mouse, if you want to call it that, the controllers, you operate and you, you change the, the computer visuals that's inside the headset. And the new technology or the new advancements in this is that we don't need controllers anymore. So we can, we can use hand tracking now. So if you put your hands in front of your face, in front of this um, device, it picks up your hands. So it knows exactly where your pulse sits and where your extremities sits with your fingers. And then it transposes all the bones. And as you move your fingers, it interpolates and makes some suggestions on what you want to show. On the other side of the spectrum, closer to real life, we have this augmented reality. Now, just a disclaimer, augmented reality is not just visuals. So any sense that we have, any one of the five senses, I mean, we, we can augment that. So we can augment smell, we can augment hearing and visuals as well. So that typically involves a device that needs to go in front of, in, in your line of sight, or in your view, and then computer, generated information gets displayed onto that that device so on the on the right that picture over there that's a more expensive hololens type of things that's a, from microsoft typically on the left hand side you find something smaller which goes just over normal glasses and it projects something in you into your iris in your eyes and you can see some small screen in your field of view and the bottom one is just the explanation on, again, some device over your, over your eyes and the normal cell phone or something in your hand, a handheld device that augments information over real life. Okay, I'm going to try to show you some examples of, of these, these type of technologies. Just to take that into a more visual, visual representation, you can see right in the middle, that is where your extended reality sits. We know that's the combination of all the, the mixed reality, the virtual reality, and the augmented reality. And those, the typical connection between the two, we have the digital world on the one side, we have the real world on the other side, but then we have digital overlays. And on the left-hand side, there's some interaction and manipulation on it. So as I move my mouse, I, use my, I see my cursor move on my screen, and that is typically how we manipulate the information or at least um, suggestions in the environment. What's the application of this? So where do we apply this XR technology? First cock in the wheel or in the, in the machine is the learning and the training component. So because we can now go and film and 
very hazardous underground environment, maybe a fall of ground or a seismic event. We can film that or generate it on a computer animation. And we can teach people the consequences without them exposing them to the dangers. So in the, in the training space, I think South African mining companies are well advanced to using this technology in the training space. And that's the relative, that's the easy, easy place to apply the technology because it's visual and you can you can add, I mean, it's not related or not only um, linked to one language, for instance, or one animation. Then that will drive your collaboration. So collaboration means that you can have remote experts, a person sitting on his um, vac vacation, annual leave at the sea, something happens on the mine, a person with a device goes and scan or videos the, the environment, quickly link up to the expert on the, on the beach, he logs in with his, his um, either phone or laptop, look at what he's shown and then give a call from that side and then operations can continue. So collaboration is quite nice. Zoom is a good example of it. So you get people at different places, physical locations that collaborate on the same, same instance. And then all of this is now linked with visualization. So we generated a huge amount of data in some other way. Now we sit with all that data, how do we visualize that? So this technology that we are looking at and talking about is really, if you have the data, how do you show that to the, to the user? And then the user, how does he use that data? And how does he, maybe for making decisions easier or identifying different problems? So this is not, this technology is not collecting data. For instance, if you look at LIDAR systems or radar systems, or even your standard monitoring systems on a mine or any, any industry, that collects the data in some sort that we can visualize that. All right. So that was an, a lot of technical talk, just the, the background of it. So how did we use it in the mining industry? So in 2015, when we came up to this floor with the facilities we have, um, I identified the, the condition or the situation where students are studying towards becoming a mining engineer, but they haven't been underground yet. So they don't know what the environment looks like. They don't know what the hazards are that's, that's inherent into the mining business. Because we work with rock, we can assume that rock might, might um, injure you in some other way. So I, my dream was to, to develop an instance where I can take people into an underground environment, a, a mock environment, if you want to call it that, and then let them identify the hazards and then, of course, eliminate it or not being exposed to that. So we developed this system. It's typical two rooms that the students are now exposed to. So in the first room, you will see there on the left-hand side, the student, this is a good example of mixed reality. So you have the person standing there with the device and in the background, you can see what he's looking at. So in this training room, there's currently there's six little, of these little podiums and every podium has a model of a geological hazard inside of it, of, on top of it. So that one that's visual there, it's a dome. So if you have, it's like an upside down portal, I'm going to call it that. So that, that piece of rock can come down and that's of course a very, very high risk for injuries occurring. So what the student can do, he can look around it. This one also rotates so the student can look all sides how it should be looking at because he's now standing in this glass rock mass and he can see the hazard um, inside the rock mass. And then if he press the button, he then gets teleported inside the environment so there you can see he's been loaded inside. So he's now in the cavity, in the excavation, so you can see the rock wall. And the only thing that he will see in that in the real space is a circle on a on the in the roof, in the hanging wall. So you can, I don't know if it's that easy observed, but there's a circle around there, and that's the only thing that he can see. And then he should be able to convert that into the theory and say, well, I have a loose little lens on top of me that might come down. And this is, the, this is the, the teaching we have to the students. So from my side as the lecturer, I open this up for the students. I can see which student has gone through all six environments. Um, did they study it? Did they know the, the theory side of it? Did they actually interacted with the environment and went inside to identify it as well? So there you can see the YouTube link. 
um, after the presentation, I'm gonna post all the YouTube links again in the chat. So you can just refer to that and get, get a little bit more of an example of that. Um, so the next one, we have this mobile manufacturing unit. So there, there we have this explosive truck that's in the open, open pit operations. So before we can use that piece of equipment, we need to fill in a pre-use checklist. So make sure that everything is fine on the vehicle before we use it. So you'll see that there's a, let me just change my, so there's a checklist. So the student needs to go through this 37 items. So what's the general condition of the, of the vehicle? Is it clean or not? Is the, is the tires flat or is the side of the tires cracked? Um, windscreen cracked or fine? Is there a license disc? So all those type of things, the students then select yes or no, or good condition or whatever the case may be. And he teleports around it and he can see what the actual, um, what, what the pre-use checklist is typically all about. What I want to do, I want to see if I can open up my link to, okay, I'll do it after the presentation. I'll just quickly go through the, the YouTube videos and show you a little bit of the examples. What we also did is we have our, we have our class notes, which the student can typically print out or keep it as, as a PDF if they want to have it on the tablet. So we have the class notes there and the moment they take up the normal smartphone, they downloaded our app. So as they scan this page, it picks up this module. So in this case, you can see it's a front, uh, it's a shovel. So you can see this piece of machine. That's typically the bucket orientation. That's how the loading program process works, the loading profile. Different piece of machine. So here you have the rope shovel. So this one is used, there's a big machines running inside there, controlling the ropes, picking up the shovels where this one is hydraulically operated. So it's nice and well to read it in text and see what um, the specs are on that, but to really just to see the model working and have an idea of that, I mean, also opens up the students' minds about the technology. So here's an example, you can see that. So it's as the moment your cell phone picks up that little code or a QR code, it opens the 3D model. And then as you move your phone around it and zoom in and out or forward and backwards, it opens up the different models. So very good for exposure and not there's zero interaction on it. So the student can't click on the device or make it move. It's really just to, to show the model and show how it looks. It's quite easy for these are big things that's out there, but also if you if we apply our mind a little bit about the con um, the complex uh, content that we need to transfer to the students and it's we, how do you explain stress to a student how do you explain the loading loading environment on a pillar for stability so those type of things can then be animated for students to better learn right so all being said all that has been developed by the multimedia team but me as a lecturer i don't want to always talk to them and ask when they have availability, I want this next video to be uploaded. So we created this platform. And um, so what we have on that platform, we have this scenario scenario training. When I was, I'm an engineer and I don't like reading. So back in the day when I was still at school, I needed to do the, the English reading or Afrikaans reading. So the best books for me was Choose Your Own Adventure. So if you come to the bottom of the page, you must make a decision go to page three if you want to jump out of the plane or whatever the case may be and then you turn the pages and you then you continue the story now that was still in the back of my mind so what we can do now we create a scenario now what you see here is from this, the health sciences department because all their procedures are um, scenario based so in this case we have a dummy 55 year old male being pushed into the emergency room you can see he's unconscious. So what do we do? So that's the first question. And then the student must select on that on that plane, on that little tray, best of three. So check pulse, you check the pulse and it plays the next part of the video. So then the doctor tells the, the nurse to check the pulse and the, the video continues. 
So as you then progress through this, this scenario, if you make a wrong choice, I mean, the dummy dies and you get to learn why, what happened, where was your, where was your decision actually when, where did you get, went off the path? So there's only two, uh, two reasons why people change their behavior is either religion or near-death experiences. So if we can simulate something of that to the student, maybe he can then turn this out when, he, when he's in that situation, he knows exactly what to do. Okay, and then the last one, just to show the, the hand tracking. So what we have here is a jaw thrust procedure. So typically when your ER people arrive on a scene of accident and there's people that's unconscious, the first thing they must need, or they need to do is to check that the person is at least breathing. So they have to open up the airways and the doctor showed the multimedia people typically on the dummy, how it, where your hands need to be positioned and how you open up the jaw to open up the airways, especially if you expect a neck, neck injury. So the, the head needs to be still, you need to put your hands in the right place and then with your fingers, open up the jaw to make sure the airways are open. So that is now simulated in the, in the VR space in your headset. So you know your hands and know where to at least put it. So that's another example of that. So in conclusion, typically the XR technologies is there to enhance the training. So it's not, not necessarily replacing your typical chalk and talk or your contact session. It is something in addition to. So we have still the hardcore teaching in the class. We still have the e-learning where we have multiple choice questions sent to the students and videos and stuff that we can accommodate. Then you can go into the VR space, the AR space, and then eventually should be ready for competency tests right at the end. Technology is very good for exposure. So you can take um, scholars into a mine, which is in real life not allowed by law because miners are not allowed to be taken underground. So you can expose people to the environment, to the industry. Um, I just read this morning that UK is very concerned about their mining industry because they haven't had new uh, students enrolling in mining since 2019. And they are looking at at least 200 professionals every year. So again, as we lost a lot of our te technical abilities to Australia and America the last few years, I think U UK is also gonna stand in queue for our expertise. Muscle retention, oh yeah, muscle retention memory. So if I teach you what to expect, if you get into a lab or to an ER center or underground environment, if you know what to look for, once you get into that real environment, I mean, the time spent in the VR is not is never wasted. So you, you learn and learn what to look for and how far to move, and then ultimately to change your behavior. So that is it on the presentation side. Um, if you can just allow me, I'm gonna paste the slide, the links again for the for the YouTube videos, and I'm just busy opening up the first one. I'm going to share that as well. So just talk you through a little bit of what you see here. So here you can see the, let me see where I'm on it. So there you can see the guy opening up, going into the, into the training room. So access control, so that every student logs in with his own number. So that distinguishes the students together. There you can see the different pylons, so you have the different different geological hazards. Student then navigates, reach into it, and then gets loaded into that environment. So now you can see, for us, it looks like it's complete darkness, but underground, you have this headlamp and you, you cast the light there where you're looking at. So looking forward, he now looks at it and then travel into it, just jump a few steps. So there you can see he identifies the, the hazard. Let me just jump back a little bit. So he sprays it, and if you selected enough of the blocks, then of course it turns green, and it shows that the student has, has identified it correctly. And so you go through the whole, the whole, whole spill of, of it. Okay. In the practice round, so once you go gone through all of that, you can go and look at different environments. 
So there's a little bit of difficulties in there. So you have a small, a small layout, basic layout. So just want to see if the video shows the, the layout right there. But you can see it's a small layout that goes into the environment for that one. Okay, let me just look at the second second one, the checklist. Okay, can you still see the Johan? Just give me an indication. Can you still yes. see the video? Yeah, we okay. can see it. Thanks. All right, so here you can see the student again logging with her student number. So what happened on this one is, I mean, they gave it for me for testing. So I went in there, I got 16 out of 37 looking at the checklist. So it was uh, relatively difficult for me uh, being an underground miner to look at this thing. Uh, finished, submitted, got the marks and said, no, well, I'm, I'm the lecturer, I can't score 16, so I need to do it again. So I went in, I selected everything that's on there. And then I submitted, I got 12 out of 37. And then they told me the whole system randomized the 37 items. So you can watch me doing my checklist. The moment you're going to do your checklist, it's going to be a new vehicle. So it can, I mean, different, different aspects. So you can see the guy looking at the screen. So it's the license disk there. You can walk around. There you can see the interaction. So you can... The indicator lights are working. The number plates are there. As it goes close, you can see the different items. You just jump a little bit. You can interact with the cabins. So you can open up the doors. You can look inside the cabin, check if anything is wrong, wrong there. And jump a little bit and see. Where's the interaction of the... So it's quite involved. Uh, end of the year, we have the blasting people also attending a short course. And for final assessment, they need to do the checklist. And there's people that can finish this in less than five minutes. So they know exactly where the system is looking at. Scenario training, maybe if we can do that one quickly. So here you can, oh, now you also see I don't have a paid YouTube. So that's just the platform we developed. So it's an online system. We built the scenarios. Okay, I'm just gonna see where the whole, whole system starts. Okay, there's the question. So you can see the person is now looking into the environment. So there's the nurses, there's the doctor standing around it. If you look behind you, you'll see the actual um, instruments in your ER room. So it can explain the scenario and you have to make your choice. So you can just move that out of the way maybe. So just to see the what's happening. So there's the dummy. So these dummies are typically about 750,000 rand. So if you can, if you say the student needs to go and do a, have to administer a drip or intervenient um, injection, if they stuff up the arm, then they need to replace the arm for 30,000 30, rand. So you must make sure that the students at least know what to do before they get to the dummies. And this helps with that the muscle, muscle memory and retention of the information. So there you can see the moment you select your option, it loads the next video, and there they need to start the CPR process. And you can see, you get the feel because it's quite involved, it's quite in your space. And you see what's happening. Last demo, just quickly showing you the jaw thrust. So in case of emergency, you typically don't want to do this to a person that's conscious. So the system picks up your hands. Now the operator is putting his palms on the cheekbones. The fingers have a specific place where to put it down. You can see on the left-hand side. So that finger is still in the wrong place. The others are right. So you have to... Position your fingers correctly. Once you have that, you have to act, you have to now do the procedure. So if all is green, then you know you're in the right position, then you need to start the maneuver. Okay, so it's nice. You can make it as unsensitive as you want to. You can change the person lying there. It's all digital available. So 
you can change to whatever ever case your desire is. Okay, so I think that is from my side. It's um, that's what we are doing. Uh, we are setting it up and setting up the new generation for for what's happening. So I think, Jan, I think I'll open the floor for questions. Yes, Jani, that was um, slightly different from the days when all of us were students. Um, my first question is, how did you do it before this? How did you take mining engineers underground to get used to what's happening there before you had this virtual reality process? In my days, the whole department was 60 students big. So that's from first year to final year. I'm not calling it a fourth year because some people were not for fourth year when you get there. So the whole department is 60 students. And the final year students is about 10 to 15 students. So it's small. You get into a minibus and you drive to the mines. And back in the day, the, the regulations about visits wasn't that stringent. So it was easy in the past to take a small group on the ground and you let them let them experience the real deal. So in 2017, I had a final class of 68 students. So I mean, the whole department was just under 300 students strong. So that was quite involved. So yeah, now I have to buy, rent a, a touring bus, get people to there. Then you have to split up in smaller groups because you can't handle 60 on the ground. So I think that necessitated the, the idea of making it sure that people, before they get there, at least get sensitized on what's happening. So again, this doesn't replace the underground trips. We still need to organize underground trips and mine tours to the students. But now we can we can focus the, the questions about something specific. Look at where, where's the fault? Can you identify the fault type of things? So I think the times has changed with regards to legals around mines and mine visits and the difficulty to get people on the ground. Mm -hmm. and yeah, there's a question from Bernard. Um, could this technology be used to actually mine underground without actually being underground? Yeah. Okay, um, the answer is yes, it can be done. Is it easy? No, it's not easy at all. So there is examples of the Australian companies are actually doing it quite well for surface mines because we have access and we have GPS and we, we do have fiber and Wi-Fi and all the fancy things. So underground environments is quite unique. We don't, we, we struggle to locate and have specific geolocations for instruments and devices and machines. But with the new technologies with regards fiber and the ease of Wi-Fi systems on the ground, I mean, it becomes more and more accessible, but it's still not easy. Hmm. So in the South African context, maybe just a little bit of elaboration on that. In the South African context, our mines has been designed to be labor intensive. So we designed mines with small tunnels where typical machines can't get into. So com just changing your conventional mining methods into a mechanized method, I mean, we can't just change over and say, we're gonna now start mechanized mining. All the new sections, new areas might be designed for that, but the old parts, the old mines still need to mine with handheld machines and people actually physically going on the ground. So it also depends on where and what type of mining method has been designed for in the past. Yanni, yeah, in some way I did read that this VR center was the first um, of its kind in Africa. Yeah. Is it still that unique? Is it, no, what does, what do the other universities do? How do they teach their engineering students? Okay, it is still quite unique that um, the VR center is located here. So context in that history is in 2012, our HOD went to Australia and they have the, the same technology there. So we just wanted to copy and paste and bring it to South Africa. And the moment we landed here and we started with the facilities and we built everything, 2015, three years down the line, I mean, technology changed quite a lot. So we then opted for the, the better versions of the, of the tech. So we have the same system, but just new technology in here. But the problem with this is, this is not mobile at all. So it has to be, if you want to experience the immersive technology that we have, you have to travel to our department and, and need to be in our facility. And from 2018 till now, the mobile market has opened up tremendously. 
So I'm not going to spend 5 million rand and have 20 students at a time going into an environment where I can spend 5,000 rand and you can be anywhere around the world to actually experience it. So the focus is more going mobile. That's the one thing. And the other universities, again, I mean, for them teaching, they have videos, they have um, some sort of interaction or ex exploratory work. But I mean, that's still still in the early stages going forward. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I think Derek, uh, your question was possibly answered where Derek asked if the tech, if you can make it available to other universities. Well, the technology is, um, I mean, if you just talk hardware, I mean, all these things, if you go into Amazon or even, even take a lot, does, does sell these technologies, these hardware devices. The problem is it's like buying a cell phone. So you'll get the cell phone and there's just a few apps on, on there and you can dial and send the SMS. For all the rest, you have to download applications. And that's where the real bottleneck sits. So people in industry, and that's what we experience now as well, people in industry come to us and say, oh no, we tried VR and it doesn't work because we bought this device and there's nothing on it. And they say, yeah, it's like buying a computer from incredible correction. So I mean, it's there, it's a computer. Once you switch off, you have Windows, that's it. So you have to start up and now you have to install all the apps. Mm. So the technology is really, um, from our side, we would like to focus on commercially available technology. So anyone can buy stuff. We can buy 3D cameras off the internet. We can use our cell phones these days to take 3D images. So a lot of things is commercially available. And for the rest of it, I mean, if you want to talk about uh, the knowledge transfer, I mean, if it's, if it's generated, the coalition between South, South African universities has also changed in the, the atmosphere. Because in the past, we were competing against BITS and UJ with regards to mining engineering space. And then in the recent years, we said, well, everyone focused in a niche market around the, the industry. So you have people that looks at the visualization, which is us. You have it. So VITS is looking at collecting the data and UJ is looking at using the data. So it's all that instead of having to compete for the same student, we say, listen, what is your interest? And let's then advance that, that interest for you. So I see for a, for a good mine in South Africa, you need at least three engineers. Mm. So one from UJ, one from Tux, and one from VITS. <laughs> so we all speak, we all work in unison now. Mm. Yanni, thanks. I think there's um, other comments just about the cost, which could be prohibitive for other universities to employ the same and then also how healthy or how practical it could have been for um, a radiologist or other health practitioners um, in training. Yeah, okay, just quickly on the cost. I mean, when we started, just to give you an idea on the cost, the facilities, that's, that's the building within and then also the projectors and all the hardware that we have, that was 15 million rand. Um, that includes headsets, which is around 50,000 Rand, a headset, and you have to have a powerful computer to drive that, which is also about 100,000. So for one person to experience that in very high quality, you need about 150,000 Rand to set up. So that now, the price has dropped, you can get away with maybe about 80,000 these days. And also the, the mobile sets, we bought it at about 12,000 Rand a piece. It's now currently going, and I mean, we bought, we, we ordered some yesterday and we paid seven and a half for it. And it's a newer version. It's the it's a second generation. So it's better quality, it's better technology. So it's half the price already. So, I mean, cost, cost, cost is not, the, it's not the, the hindrance anymore. I think the cost can be overcome. And again, the question is, why do you want to use it? Why don't you just have a 3D uh, PDF viewer on your screen we can also just rotate it. Why do you have to be immersed in that environment? Why do you need to look around and watch your back as you're looking in, looking at the other thing as well? Okay, and you said the other question, so that's the cost. No, it's just um, that that's, this could have been used very well for health and um, medical practitioners. Yes, exactly. I mean, you, you don't get that exposure until you know exactly what to do. So we also built a, or not we, that the multimedia people also built a application where they did a soil analysis. 
So they went and they scanned the whole environment of the lab, which is a three by three space. And that is a physical space the student can walk with the headset. So I need to walk three paces and pick up a sieve and then stack it on a certain, certain pattern, then put in three scoops of soil, then put that on a shaker and you see the size of the distribution. So that is taught in the virtual space. And there's certain things they need to be trained on to do it. Because, I mean, we, as, we assume that if you go into an environment, um, it's, it's not that um, terrifying. I mean, we get students that's grown up in different social stances and they just getting into a small confined space is actually a problem for them. So it sensitizes them a little bit. So once they step into the real lab for the, for the experiment or for the, for the practical, I mean, it's not new stuff. They know where it is. They know where the sieves are located. They know where the tools are. So it helps in that in exposure to that environment before you get to the real dangerous stuff that can cut your, cut your finger. Okay, Yanni, thank you very much. I think um, we will end it there. Um, it's a pleasure. It was really, uh, for me, very new. And I think now we may understand our children or grandchildren who are students a little bit better because <laughs> they yeah. really do it different from us. Sorry, I just they want do, to mute you what, for the fun. Okay. Well, just from my side, also, thank you very much um, for inviting me again. So, Johan, you do have my contact details. So, if there's any other questions, you're welcome to pass it on to us. And then maybe if you're in, the, in town, I don't know what you will need to do in the, in the north. If you're in town, you're also welcome to contact me, maybe just to get a physical tour in our facilities. Thank you very much, Yanni. We really appreciate your time and effort with this presentation. And yes, all the best up there in the north. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye.